Hey, what's up guys? My name is Michael Westbrook. As always, thank you for watching. If you've seen some of my previous videos and you dug them and you aren't already, please consider subscribing. One of the things that I am most proud of here on the channel is that I create all my own music, whether it's the demos or even the music behind talking parts and in the vlogs. That is all stuff that I write and record here for the channel. Now, I get a lot of questions about my demos and how I create all my music whether it's how I do the drums or how I record guitars. Um, you guys always have a lot of questions about those. So today, this video is going to be jumping in head first. We're gonna take a listen to a demo that I created specifically for this video. And then I'm gonna kind of walk you through the process. Um, I'm gonna kind of hit some of the high points that you guys consistently ask about. And um, hopefully that gives you some insight into how I go from a pedal to a demo. I also want to say that this video is sponsored by Red Panda. They recently sent me the Raster 2 to check out. And so that's the pedal that you'll hear demoed in the clip. Now, the Raster 2 is basically a digital delay with a super capable and super tweakable modulation section. Um, it does all kinds of stuff. It also has pitch shifting. Um, we'll hear some examples of that and kind of talk about how I use the pedal to create the demo. All right, let's get into it. I've got the session pulled up in Pro Tools now, but a couple of things before we take a look at that. There are kind of some considerations that when I sit down to create a demo that are in the back of my head or things that I'm thinking about. One is that if I'm demonstrating a product or a piece of gear of some sort, then I am going to obviously have that in mind. So I want to create parts or create music that I think highlights um, what I would do with that pedal, you know, or that piece of gear. Um, in this instance, I was coming up with sounds that um, I found inspiring from the raster, things that I liked and ways that I could see myself using it um, in real life scenarios. I'm typically not trying to cover everything that a certain product would do. I'm just kind of using it how I would use it. Another big thing that I am thinking about is just trying to work efficiently. Um, early on when I was making YouTube videos, I spent way too much time on my demos. And um, especially these days, I don't have nearly the same amount of time. So I'm trying to work quickly. I'm trying to work efficiently. That might mean that sometimes I am not maybe creating the most original parts or the most creative things um, just because there are, you know, sometimes the priority is more about working quickly and efficiently and demonstrating, you know, something about a piece of gear or a technique, um, not necessarily it being like as artistic as I can make it. So for me, that is a big, uh, a big aspect of me creating demos is just trying to work quickly and efficiently um, while also demonstrating what it is that I'm trying to demonstrate. So I've got the session pulled up and I'm just going to start at the top. This is probably one of the most common questions that I get and it's what I use for drums. So I use a plugin called Easy Drummer. Here it is here. And my go-to kind of pack that they have, the sounds, is a, a, a sound, sounds called UK Pop. I really dig the sounds that are in, um, you know, in this pack. Um, the snares sound really fat and thick. Um, and then they, some of the MIDI patterns, the drum patterns that they have um, are, are cool and, and I, I find work well for me. Um, the thing that I really like about Easy Drummer is that they have patterns, they have um, 
parts laid out into sections. So I can grab a verse part or a chorus part, um, you know, from different styles and different things. And that just allows me again to work quickly and efficiently. A lot of times when I'm creating a demo, I'll actually start with the drums. I might not even have a guitar part figured out or um, chords figured out or anything like that. Sometimes I'll just come up with, um, I'll lay out the song with just the drums. I'll have, you know, an A part and then a B part. And then generally speaking, I go back to the A part to kind of finish it up. So I'll lay out the drums um, and kind of start the structure of the song with the drums. Next is my bass. A lot of times I'll record a bass part before I record any music. That actually was the case with this particular demo. Um, I have a template set up in Pro Tools so that I open a template and it has a lot of this stuff already in place. Um, in my template currently for my bass guitar, I have a sans amp and then an API EQ. Um, typically that API EQ is set flat. On this one I'm boosting around 800. And then I have just, this is just a stock plugin for Pro Tools. It's a um, basically a, a LA3A, just kind of a, a compressor. Um, it's actually set to limiting for bass uh, that just kind of helps glue the bass in, in place. Now we'll talk about guitars. I've talked about this before on the channel, but I typically record all of my guitars um, for something like this. If I'm not demonstrating some sort of modeler, I'm typically using my amps and I'm running into a two notes captor. I have two of those. I have a four ohm and an eight ohm. This allows me, in my opinion, to kind of get the best of both worlds. I'm running my tube amps and then I'm using speaker IRs. Most of the time I'm using uh, speaker IRs that I've created and that I've made. I'm actually Actually in the process of testing a brand new batch that I made with my Carry Right Tribute Cab. You guys might have seen a previous video on that. The nice thing about using IRs like this is that I can pull up a set of IRs. Um, I typically am using the Two Notes plugin Wall of Sound. It's a free plugin that allows you to, to use uh, your own IRs as well as some of the, the Wall of Sound or the Two Notes um, speakers and cabs and all that as well. But um, I just like the interface. It has some EQ and some different things that I'll, I'll use every now and then. But typically I'm just using it as an IR loader in my DAW. The thing that I like about doing it this way is that if I record a sound and then I wanna tweak it a little bit for the mix or for the other parts, I can change the speaker IRs out later. Um, that allows me to kind of change the tone and, and maybe fit it in the mix a little better or differently than I might have when I initially recorded it. Um, um, as I'm working on these demos and these tracks, things are constantly changing. This demo in particular actually changed quite a bit. Um, you'll see that when we get to diving in some of the parts here. So the first sound that I started with was this kind of loopy sound. And um, this is a really cool sound that the raster does. I had the um, effect, it was 100% wet. So you're just hearing the delay, but it's actually pitch bending the delays and then the modulation is kind of using um, or it's kind of uh, bending that pitch. So the, the pitch is using the modulation, um, you know, and it gives us this kind of like coming up to pitch type sound. This was the first sound that I recorded and I actually had it running through the entire demo. Uh, it didn't work, so I ended up cutting it in and out, as you can see here, but um, that was kind of the initial inspiration and the initial uh, spark that got the demo going for me uh, after I had put the drums down. Here's what that sounds like. As you can see, my parts are kind of stair-stepped out here, um, just going left to right and then going down. And um, you can see kind of how it builds the song. But I will tell you that that's not how they were recorded. Um, I've just kind of organized them that way so you guys can see what's going on a little better. But um, this demo in particular for me was a little more difficult. I'm not sure if it's because I haven't been making demos as often lately because I've been on the road a lot more. Um, this year or what, but um, I kind of had to fight with this one, just figuring out how I wanted the parts and what sounds I, I wanted to use. Whatever the case, I kind of altered the arrangement on this a little bit as I went and as I came up with different parts, I recorded parts that um, I ended up you know, getting rid of and not using at all. Um, one instance of this in particular right here, as you can see on the this kind of lead part that comes in at the end, um, it's this part, I'll solo it out for you guys. Thank you. 
so on that I use the raster to kind of give me that like slapbacky lower octave thing that I thought was really cool and adds a really unique texture to it. But when I originally recorded that part, it was actually over the first A section, um, and I ended up moving it towards the end just so I could um, kind of build the song that way. And that was kind of the the highlight there at the end or the the climax of the song to this lead part. The next couple parts I want to talk about are in this A section, and there's a picking kind of dotted, almost U2-esque part, and then more of a punchier rhythm type part. I recorded all of the guitars on this demo using an AC-15 and a Tweed Deluxe clone from Trinity Amps. I wanted to record them all stereo because the raster is stereo and that really highlights what it can do. These two parts are a good example of kind of how I think about parts a lot of times. I talk about this in my course about creating and layering guitar parts, but I kind of think of things broken up um, in, a di in different categories, but also in just kind of two types of parts, a long part and a short part. I go into a lot more depth in that course, so if you're interested in that, um, or you kind of like this walkthrough of a track, I do a ton of that in the course. So you can check a link down in the description below for that. But um, this idea of short and long parts, so I would consider the kind of U2 part, even though it is fairly rhythmic, I would kind of consider it a longer part because those notes are held out. Whereas this more stabby rhythm, um, part, rhythmic part, um, that I believe was on the telly, um, that kind of has this more rhythmic, more percussive type feel. Um, and I find when I'm aware of how I'm combining short and long parts, it allows all of my parts to kind of have their own unique space and not clutter things up. Let's take a listen to this B section. I've got this chorus picking part. Now, this is something I really like about the raster is that it'll do crazy, you know, weird sounds like we did um, or like we heard with the loopy part that kind of started the track off. But it'll also do some super usable, um, you know, kind of what I think of as normal sounds, whether it be chorus or even some of the delay parts we heard. <laughs> Just a really, really great sound. And then this slide part in this section um, is also pretty rad. There, I'm using the pitch shifting ability of the raster to get just kind of a really unique sound. Um, it just kind of adds a thickness, almost a doubled kind of sound to the slide part. You'll also notice here that on all these guitars, I'm not really EQing anything. Um, even in the wall of sound, I have the EQ stuff turned off. So um, I'm pretty much just using the IRs, um, you know, as an EQ. I might tweak, uh, tweak the IR to get it to sit a little differently in the mix. Uh, I think maybe the only place that I'm actually using an EQ would be, uh, well, on this lead guitar right here. I've got a little 8K boost and taken out a little 200. Um, that's just to get that part to cut a little more. I'm probably taking out some of that 200 because it's muddying up. Um, or just that lower octave is you know, making it a little thicker than I wanted it to be. Um, another place that I'm EQing is I have these big rhythm guitars here towards the end. Let's hear those. Um, I think these just have a, a really subtle delay on them, but here's what they sound like. I record guitars like this a lot where I'm just doing these big whole notes. So I actually have this built into my template. Um, I'm using an API EQ. Um, I generally am tweaking that per song. That's not necessarily, um, these settings aren't in the template. Uh, I just have that EQ there in the template. Um, I'm using this, uh, which is basically cutting off some really low frequencies and some really high frequencies. This makes a little more space for other things that are going on in the track. And then I absolutely love this compressor from API. It's the 2500. Um, it's actually from Waze, but it's modeling an API 2500 compressor. And one thing that I did differently on this track that's kind of a, a pro compressor tip, if you will, is that typically the attack time on this compressor, I have set um, 
kind of in my template, I have it set at 10 millimeters a second. So that's a little slower attack time, which allows the initial transient of those rhythm guitars to come through. It gives you uh, some more definition um, and just makes them sound a little more aggressive. But I wanted these guitars to pull back in the mix a little bit. They just were a little too forward. I wanted to make sure that they weren't getting in the way of the lead guitar. So I actually um, sped this attack up and put it at um, this this three setting here. And for me, when I speed the attack up on a compressor like that in a mix, because it's squashing that initial transient a little more, it actually helps pull it back in the mix. So it's not as forward. When your ear hears that initial transient, um, that draws your ear's attention to it. So if you're squashing that a little more, if you're compressing it a little more, then it just naturally is going to pull it back and it's not going to be in the forefront as much. The volume might be, you know, might be metering about the same, but because you're not hearing that transient as loud, it doesn't, um, it doesn't seem as loud. So that's a good way, um, a good way to use a compressor to kind of tuck something back in the mix if it's cluttering things up or getting in the way of something else. Here you can see some of my other template things. I use the little plate from Sound Toys, and then I like this space that's set on a chamber. Um, I believe that comes with, with Pro Tools, but I mean, honestly, any kind of, you know, chamber type sound I would I would use there. I'm, I'm not too picky um, when it comes to that on, on most things. I'm just using that for a little space around the sounds, um, just, just a little vibe there. The other big piece that really helps me make these demos quickly and easily and also consistently is the Ozone Advanced plugin. I'm basically using this as a, a quick mastering plugin. Um, it is um, it has a like kind of an automatic mastering thing, this master assistant, and that just helps kind of finalize everything for me. It'll EQ it, it'll adjust some dynamics and just make it loud um, and make sure all the parts are being heard. Um, just like a normal master, you know, when you have uh, tracks in the studio mastered, just kind of helps bring out a little more detail and make sure that the volumes are consistent. Definitely check the links in the description below. I've tried to link everything I've talked about in this video. Hopefully you guys learned some things or at least got some insight into my process. I hope this was helpful for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, definitely leave me a comment below. I try to get to as many of those as I can and as time allows. That's going to do it for this one. Until next time, I'll see you out there.